Welcome back to Retro Game Coders. My name is Chris, and this is part three of the Commodore 64 Basic series. In this episode, we'll look at creating an updated version of the Dungeons & Dragons character generator. We'll look at creating a game of rock, paper, scissors. And then finally, we'll move a keyboard controlled character around the screen. First, let's talk about game logic. For your game to be fun and challenging, it'll need to have some sort of logic. And there are two kinds of logic we need to talk about. The first is the rules of the game, how the game works. The second is the render logic or the display logic, how the game updates visually. As we're building up our dungeon crawl game, we need to address both types of logic. And in Commodore 64 Basic, the logic is done with the if statement. Because of the difficulty of game logic, early games were written as two player or puzzle games. That's because the amount of processor power and space was limited. Even today, many beginner programmers struggle with game logic because they think that game logic needs to be in quote AI. But game logic can be very simple. Think about a game of Space Invaders. The logic in involved in Space Invaders is pretty much just keeping track of where the player is, where the aliens are, whether they should show a UFO or not, and if a missile has hit. There's logic for updating the score and decrementing the lives, and if you get down to zero lives then the game is over. It doesn't have to be super complicated logic, and in fact sometimes simple logic can seem intelligent. Think about Pac-Man and the behaviour of the ghost. I can't go into depth about the Pac-Man logic, but there are many articles and videos out there. And and what it comes down to is a very simple but effective pathfind algorithm. Essentially when the ghost gets to a junction it has to decide which direction to go in and each ghost is given its own personality whether it wants to get ahead of the Pac-Man if it aggressively follows the Pac-Man and so on. And there are three different phases. There's the pursuit mode, there's a panic mode and there's a flee mode. It still comes down to the fundamental logic of if this happens then do this. If this is true then do this thing. And it's it's hardly surprising then that BASIC uses the IF statement. It's literally, if this is true, then do this. So using that information, we can update our original D&D character creator to give it a more fair result. Because originally, it was possible to get either a 20 or a 0, and neither is really fair in a game of Dungeons and Dragons. Another approach is to roll 4d6 and then take the top three numbers. And that gives you a variability between 3 and 18, which is a lot more fair. Now 3 is still a terrible number but it's got to be fairer than 0. And to do this we use a simple sorting algorithm called the bubble sort. As you've probably guessed an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step process of some logic. The way the bubble sort works is each number is compared to another and if one is greater than the other then the numbers are swapped. In our case we want the numbers to bubble up to be sorted high to low. So we compare and if it's greater then it bubbles up to the next slot and lower numbers bubble down. So we do this with two nested for loops. The outer loop goes from the top to the bottom using step minus one. The inner loop compares the two numbers and swaps them if one is greater than the other. And that's where our if statement comes in. If x is greater than y then swap the numbers over in the array. So we've looked briefly at the if statement. Now let's have a look at how we can do some display logic. Historically character based displays were all we had and that's why a lot of early basic games were written for terminals. And they use control codes to display text on screen using the cursor position. The Commodore 64 is the same. You can control the cursor position using the special characters we addressed earlier. So if you look at this example, we set the color to light blue and then we move the cursor right and then we display the at symbol. And we do that twice and then we move up twice again. That's a really clumsy way of approaching character display. It's not very fast, but it does make sense and it's easy to do. Using the get command, we can get keyboard input. So unlike input where we had to press enter or return after we enter our text, with get you just have to press a key. And that means we can do things like menus, but it also means that we can control a character using keyboard input. Now we've got if and we've got get and we can position our text on screen any way we want it, then we can do our game of rock, paper, scissors. As you know with rock, paper, scissors, the idea is you choose rock, paper or scissors. Your competitor also chooses and then you display your result. And whoever has the best 
better hand is the winner. In our case, we use one, two, or three key presses. The computer decides randomly between one, two, and three, and whoever is the winner is displayed. And to make things easy to understand, we display those in columns. And then we're asked, do we want to play again? Yes or no. The logic here is really simple. If the values are the same, then it's a draw. And then for each rock, paper, and scissors, there's something that it beats. So for example, one will be a three, two will be to one, and a three will be to two. Anything else is a loss. W equals one, which means it's a win for the player. If W is zero, then it's a win for the computer. And then we simply ask if you want to play again. And we check to see if the user presses a Y or an N. Otherwise, then 360, which is the same as saying go to 360, and it looks for a key press again. Otherwise, if you press anything other than N, it'll go back to 110, which is the start of the program. Otherwise, it says goodbye, thank you for playing. With our new keyboard control powers, we can move the character around the screen. And the way we do that is first we display the map or a very crude basic map. And then we have a loop between 350 and 420. It'll keep looping round and round until the user breaks out of the program. We get P string and that puts the value of whatever key is pressed into P string and then we keep looking to see if O, P, Q or A have been pressed. If O is pressed then we do a cursor left and a cursor left and the at symbol. The reason why we have to do this twice is because when we output a character it moves the cursor. So we have to do two left cursors then place the at symbol. So we check for Q, A, O and P. We move the cursor appropriately. We print our at symbol then we go back to 350. Unfortunately this does mean that we get a trail left behind us. We can walk over walls and we can essentially just mess up the screen. So that's something we're going to have to look at next time.